Pastor Godman Akin Labi is the lead pastor of the Elevation Church, founded in 2010 with branches in Lagos, Ontario, Canada, and London, UK. The Elevation Church has a God given mandate to make greatness common. Pastor Godman is a seasoned and sought after teacher, trainer, relationship coach, and public speaker. He is also the founder and chairman of Pistis Life and Leadership Institute, a human capital development organization for leaders with a distinct framework for facilitating learning in Africa. He has authored several critically acclaimed books, including The Seven Commandments of Foolishness, Don't Waste Your Pain, Sexuality, Get a Grip, For Singles and Couples, and many others. With great joy and honor, please make welcome Pastor Godman Akilabi to the Ministers and Leaders Forum 2024. Um... While I was preparing yesterday for this meeting, and it's been on my mind for a while, uh, it was just one of those things, I think it was, as I started, I mean, after my preparation of when I was about to start, I just was flipping through. I was on my way from the airport. I just got in yesterday. It's been like three weeks of um, rigmaroling around Europe. And on our way from the airport, I was just flipping through. I haven't had much time to just go through Instagram of, or, and all that, I saw uh, that my first endeavor in ministry, which is called Rema Campus Fellowship uh, from Federal University of Technology at Korea, the young people there did a video celebrating the anniversary of the fellowship. If you have it, I wanted to play that. Uh, it would be a good place to start today. Okay, give it volume. It looks like, it looks like we're struggling with the volume a bit. Forget about this picture. This was from Exponential. It's not there. <laughs> oh. So it looks like they are not able to connect the volume. Uh... But the, 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 it was a bit of storytelling, you know, behind this. The, the fellowship was inaugurated in 1994, March, April, 94. Still a very thriving community of students and fellowship. They now have, you know, their own venue and all that. Uh, 30 years of Rema Campus Fellowship. We give thanks for the growth and impact of this church, which has touched lives of so many Okay. Rema is 30. 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 In 1994, at the Federal University of Technology, Akure, a group of students came together to form Rema Campus Fellowship. Led by Pastor Godman Akinlabi, the church began as a small gathering of students seeking to grow in their faith. Over the past 30 years, Rema Campus Fellowship has grown and flourished. From humble beginnings, the church has become a thriving community of believers reaching out to the campus and beyond. Rema Campus Fellowship has thrived with our core vision which is to raise a people of power and praise with an addiction for the Word of God. This year, it is with so much gratitude that we celebrate 30 years of Rema Campus Fellowship. We give thanks for the growth and impact of this church, which has touched lives of so many people. We give thanks for our pastor, Godman Kilabi, who has faithfully led the church through these years. We give thanks for the students, staff, and volunteers who have made Rema Campus Fellowship what it is today. As we look forward to many more years of prayer, continued growth, and impact, we say happy 30th anniversary to Rema Campus Fellowship. Rema! Praise God. I'm sure you know the reason why I'm playing the video. I'm playing the video because we're speaking to building to last. While I was an undergraduate in the early 90s, many people started 
all kinds of things in the university. Some people even dropped out to go and start ministries. And when we were telling them, you are running too fast, you are, you know, why don't you just finish your first degree? They said, no, no, God has called me. And, you know, they kept running. And some of them, we don't even know what they are doing today. Some have dropped out of ministry. Uh, some, you know, all kinds of things have happened. But there are certain things that we do that keep what we are doing stronger and stronger as the years go by. Many people want what they are doing to all of a sudden just become big. But they're not thinking about the destiny of it. The fact that a child is growing fast does not mean that the child will live long. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. We want good growth, but we want longevity at the same time. We want what we're doing to last. You know, <laughs> I've seen one month marriage before. I've seen six months marriage before. In fact, the last six months marriage I saw, I almost wept. As in, sincerely, I almost wept. The guy bought the lady a brand new BMW X6 on the wedding day. That marriage lasted six months. One of their friends, the, one of the groom's men, uh, happened to be a protege of mine, was the one that went to drag me, that came to drag me into the issue. When I sat down with the lady, I, I almost cried. Because uh, the, the, the fact that something, you know, started with a bang or with a lot of emotion and a lot of this does not mean it's going to last. So, what God really wants in all that we do from church to business and everywhere is that we, we, we have, we start with the end in mind. We start thinking about how this thing is going to last. And it's very important that we stay dedicated to the things, the principles that make for uh, uh, lasting legacies. Um, last week, uh, Wednesday, to be a week, next, I mean, tomorrow, I was in Bristol in the UK. And I had the opportunity of visiting, in fact, this didn't come to my mind earlier, I will have also brought the pictures up. I had the opportunity of visiting the oldest Methodist church ever. That was the Methodist church, the, the, the cathedral where John Wesley and Charles Wesley started. They preserved it. It's a small church. Preserved it, and now it's the, a museum for the Methodist church. My wife and I, you know, just booked a time and went into that place. Just staying in that place for like one hour. All kinds of thoughts were going through my mind. Because this, was, this church was built in 1700, 1730, 1740, you know, around that time. John Wesley had gone to Oxford University and then came to Bristol to start this work. That work, which is the Methodist Church, still existing up to today, globally. Globally. And you see artifacts preserved from that time till this time in some of the rooms. The room where he stayed, the personage, you know, the bed and all that since 1734, 1735. And the organization is still standing. There are certain prices that we need to be willing to pay for longevity if we're not going to be a flash in the pan. Uh, in Pentecostal Christianity, we stand a risk the risk of everything good and lovely shining and a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, but not thinking of how are we going to preserve this thing and how is it going to last. So everything that we're doing, we need to always think about it from the point of view of how it lasts. In the Acts of the Apostles from chapter 2, when the early church started, they knew they were building a legacy for Jesus or for the movement that Jesus started. I mean, the, one of the proof that the power of God is real is that somebody can lead a movement for three and a half years and it won't fizzle out. 
But there are things in the foundation of that movement that all of us must tear ourselves to and must come to terms with if what we are also doing for Christ will last for time and eternity. Are you still with me? So, built to last. Let me read from 1 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 8. Qualification of deacons. 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 to 13. He said, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not giving too much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let this also first be tested. Somebody say tested. Yeah. Say, let this also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons and be found blameless. By the way, just, just in case I forget, the word blameless does not mean perfect. To be blameless does not mean that you are perfect. It simply means that you conduct your affairs in such a way that even when your imperfection shows, you cannot, you, people cannot blame you because you, you, you've done all that you can do. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So to be blameless is different from being perfect. And that's, that, these are the things that the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, as qualifications of deacons or ministers. Say so likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their, their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. There are essentials for building to last. There are essentials for unprecedented impact that will last. And I want to speak to three of those essentials. Three essentials, and this is not all, but just three. Essentials for building to last and creating unprecedented impact. From the writings of the Apostle Paul, we will get a glimpse of these essentials here and there. Like I said, the fact that something starts, you know, I was asking my wife this morning, I said, we need to codify the things that really make for longevity. Because when I saw that video yesterday, I was thinking to myself, so you mean that fellowship that I started in 1993, actually, but inaugurated in 1994, yeah, that is still thriving and doing well, despite the fact that I don't even do anything directly with them again, apart from maybe visiting, maybe once a year, sometimes once in two years. I haven't been there now since immediately after COVID or so that I went once. And out of these 30 years, I served in this staff for almost 15 years, and I could not even deploy myself because I was under authority. You understand what I'm saying? It, I couldn't behave like I'm trying to build something else. Though I built it before and I left it for other people to run while I submitted myself where I was serving. Now we just have one of our pastors, Pastor of our Ibarra Church, is the one that they report to directly and manages their affairs. There are certain things that make for longevity about 15 sets of leaders have passed through that fellowship in the last 30 years because they mostly serve for two years and then go. Some of them serve with us in ministry. Some have gone to do great things on their own, starting their own ministry or serving in other ministries. Building to last is what Jesus wants from all of us because the Bible says everyone's work shall be tested and tested sometimes with fire. And to see whether it will burn. And if you build with hay and stubble and grass, the Bible says it will be burned. And it may not last. But there are certain things will build on. And what I'm sharing with us in the next 30 minutes or so, is, is, it, it will sound simple to you. 
but I need you to hear, to, to hear me out where. I'm also going to be using contemporary language so that we, it can resonate with us very well. Three essentials to unprecedented impact and building to last. One is discipline. Discipline. You've heard this word severally, but I want in the next seven to ten minutes to break this thing down very well based on my own personal experience and the experience I've garnered even within my circle of friends. Discipline. Discipline. It was George Washington that says that discipline is the soul of an army. Is that it makes small number formidable, procures success to the weak, and esteem for all. Discipline, 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 discipline. Discipline is the soul of an army. Discipline is what makes us commit to vision. Vision is the starting point. In that short video that we watched, you saw them talking about the vision of that fellowship that was crafted 31 years ago. To raise a people of power and praise with an addiction for the word of God. That vision is still there, reverberating, you know, after 30 years. But yet, what makes a vision going stronger is discipline. The discipline. Discipline is the soul of an army. It makes small number formidable. Today, uh, thank God for crowd. But I tell pastors all the time, the more of your people that you can bring into the core, the burden bearers, the ones who can sacrifice, who have signed up. You see, Jesus raised 12 disciples first. And the root word for discipline and disciple is the same. Yeah. The, the, the real deal about discipleship is discipline. Are you still with me today? That's the real deal. So when you look at it, apart from the vision and the grace and the anointing of God upon Christ, he had to raise 12 people who will line up to certain disciplines and stay committed to that vision and move them from Nathaniel, come and see, to Nathaniel, come and die. Are you still with me today? The journey of moving people from come and see to come and die is what we call discipleship, which is about discipline. It's about discipline. So, people around us that we're depending on to do ministry, if you're an under shepherd here today, listen to me. One of your greatest assignments as an under shepherd is to, to be discipled, to learn a life of discipline so that you can carry a vision that God has given to someone else. Those of us who are set men and women, we also need to understand that we must model what we want other people <laughs> If you get into what they call the new room, which is that place I visited in Bristol, that uh, John Wesley's place, you see on the wall, this guy, all is, is life of discipline. It's something about his prayer life. Something about his passion for abolition of state trade. Something about his passion. All kinds of things. And you see, what sustained passion is discipline. It's discipline. Without the strength of discipline, we stand a little chance at reaching our goals or <laughs> running our lives. Without a, a, the, the strength of discipline. I love this definition by a man called Scott Peck. He says, discipline is the act of shedding the pain and pleasure in life. The act of shedding pain and pleasure. Pain and pleasure. To be able to say, I won't run away from pain and only look towards pleasure. A lot of the time what God wants is for me to be able to face the pain so that the pleasure can come later. You know, life runs on the principle of play now and pay later or pay now and play later. And that is the real deal about discipline. Confronting painful things first and allowing pleasure to follow after is not natural to humans. Yet for life <laughs> to run well, we have to be able to learn the discipline of confronting 
painful things first. The wisdom of self-discipline keeps us accountable to God, to friends, family, as well as to our, uh, to, to our own destinies and to the dreams and desires that we carry. That's what it does. The wisdom of self-discipline holds us accountable. Many people want to build to last, but they don't want to be accountable. And it's the, 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 the wisdom of self-discipline that brings us to that place of accountability. Let me quickly discuss three types of discipline. There are many types, but I'll, I'll, I'll discuss three types. Don't forget, I'm talking about three things. These are not the three things. I'm only talking about discipline. But within this discipline, let's look at three types of discipline. Is somebody learning something here? Are you learning something here? Very important. Everyone online, please, just stay with me. Three types of discipline. One is preparational discipline. The great difference between achieving an activity is discipline of preparation. The discipline of preparation. If you want to build anything that will last, you must engage preparational discipline. Anytime I have the privilege of sitting and thank God for my friend who, you know, really dragged me into the inner carcass of uh, our father, Dr. David Oedepo. Anytime we sit with him, whether personal or in the group, <laughs> one thing you will see, I mean, one day when this place was being built and Bishop visited, not the dedication but the we, when we finished, we went to the office. <laughs> Just across the road there. We sat there. They were even looking for him at Kidan Land. They didn't know that we kidnapped him. <laughs> well, he decided to stay with us for almost 40 minutes or so. But one thing that he was saying that day, he says, praying without planning is praying without knowing. And he said it only God knows how many times. Am I saying the truth? He was just repeating it. He said, playing without planning is playing without knowing. You know, on social media today, they say, be playing. They play. Uh -huh. What he was saying is that when you say, eh, I will just lock myself up in one place and, you know, pray, 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 that is good. But when you come out of that place, you must come out with a plan. You must come out with what the Holy Ghost has said. You must come out with how you're going to prepare to actualize what God is saying. It's one thing for God to speak. It's another thing for man to draw a plan according to divine counsel for the execution of it. This is, and we do that from season to season for anything to last. We cannot abandon the responsibility for the fulfillment of a vision to God. God has his part, man has his part. Yeah. Angels did not build the uh, temple of Solomon. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Man has a desire to build a house for God. God sanctions it and started to make supplies for him. But if you read the story of Solomon very well, the Bible was very detailed about everything they did. The architectural measurements they could be it. And they, you know, this and that, and this of gold and this of that. Why do you think such details exist in the Bible? It's to tell us that our work with God must not be devoid of certain details. And preparational discipline is very important. Scripture talks about anyone who wants to build a tower and will not count the cost first to see whether he has enough to finish it. And Proverbs 24 and verse 27, especially... Uh, uh, in, I think in Living Bible Translation or so, which talks about prepare your work outside, make it fit for yourself in the field, and then afterwards build your house. It, it's, it's important that we engage the discipline of preparation. Good preparation will always prevent poor performance. Good preparation will prevent poor performance. So preparational discipline enables us to lay a good foundation for anything in life, including a ministry, a marriage, whatever it is. Preparational discipline just helps with the foundation. Foundation. And you see, 
Anything that will last must have a good foundation. Yeah. Anything that will last must have a good foundation. And to achieve a good foundation, you need preparational discipline. To be able to sit down and prepare. Esther prepared with the whole of Israel to meet the king. One night with the king. But if you read Esther chapter 14 from verse 15, you know, down to 17, you will see how long it took them to prepare for one night with the king. Preparational discipline. Preparational discipline. One night with the king, but it took a lot of preparation. Number two, emotional discipline. Emotional discipline. As a man and a woman of God, you cannot be a person of untamed emotions. Enough of stories of pastors slapping their wife in the front of their associates. Enough of stories of pastors calling people up while they are preaching and lambasting them in front of everybody. What should not be done in the open? Even the scripture says don't rebuke an elder openly. The person may be younger than you, but if he's serving a certain level in your church, he's an elder in that church. Elder does not mean old age. Yeah. That's why I said the elders that rule well are worthy of double honor. It's not talking about age. It's talking about how committed, how integrated they are to that vision. And it is bad emotion when we just lash out, when we, we I mean, <laughs> was it, uh, who was I talking to? I think Pastor Me was there too. Our friend, uh, Reverend George is in Port Harcourt. He was telling us some of the funny things that have happened in that region. I mean, a, a pastor actually slapped his wife in the church. Yeah. In somewhere in Port Harcourt there. Said so the attendance of that church just came. <laughs> People even know that if this man can slap his wife like this, we are not safe. He can break bottle on our own head. <laughs> I, but what will make somebody do that? It's unbridled emotion, untrained emotion, untamed emotion. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. It means, the Bible is not saying I must never be angry. Anger is a legitimate emotion. But whether I will rein it in, allow it to control me, or I will control it is another thing. Are you still with me today? Yeah. And you may be dealing with any other kind of emotion. It may not be anger. Yours may be envy, it may be, you know, uh, gossip, it may be anything, anything that is, <laughs> you know, many years ago, I, I, I learned that emotions are good, but they must not get hold of certain departments of our life. Emotions help us to celebrate life and adapt to losses. Yet, when we extend their job description to include key decision areas like marriage, like ministry, you know, and all that, we find that they, they have reached their level of incompetence. You cannot run ministry with emotions. Yeah. You can't run ministry with emotions and you expect that things will last. So emotional discipline is very important. When life is lived on the basis of feeling, then disillusionment and self-destruction may become our lot. We cannot live life on the basis of feeling. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 24, Hebrews 11 and 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. This is what it means to rein in your emotion. Not everything that looks good is God. And if you want to build something that will last, we cannot run just with emotions. You know, I was thinking about this and meditating once about Adam and Jesus. In Luke 2 and verse 52, the Bible talks about how Jesus grew in knowledge, in stature, you know, and all that. Grew emotionally and all that. Because when it says it grew in stature, part of it is emotional growth. And it grew in favor with God and with man. But when you think about Adam, Adam as a full-blown human being. Do you know that Adam never used his faith for anything particularly? Not even his faith to get wife. They brought a wife to him. And so, when we approach ministry from that standpoint, the problem is that we, uh, there are things that will come to us that we don't have the emotional fortitude to withstand. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. 
whilst Jesus was this, the, the, developing emotionally, everything was coming to someone like Adam on a platter of gold, like I said. When issues will come, Adam could not handle those issues because he has refused to develop emotionally. When you read Hebrews 11, for instance, you will never find the name of Adam there as somebody who walked by faith, as one of the heroes of faith. Instead, you will find Abel. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice because he moved to do something and he was not going to allow his emotions to stop him. He, 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 the Bible reckoned with the fact that what he brought was something that would be painful to him. So if it's about emotion, he shouldn't bring it. And that was what caused the problem between him and his brother. Because the other one was just about emotion, emotion, emotion. Can you help me tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, uh, say, develop emotionally. Say, the discipline of emotion will help you to build something that will last. The third one is the discipline of appetites. Discipline of appetites. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, when you read from verse 10, Solomon was writing. He says, uh, Whatever my eyes desire, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Somebody say, Any pleasure. <laughs> For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on the work that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed it was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. This was a man who just unleashed and just did whatever he liked without a discipline of appetite. He said anything, anything that my heart desire, I gave it. When you compare Solomon to Daniel, for instance, in Daniel 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacy, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chiefs of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. The difference between Solomon and Daniel, both had a call of God on their lives to serve in different areas, but one said anything that my heart desire, I give it to it. The other one says, no. I propose in my heart that I will not defile myself. Our appetite, whether for food, drink, sex, all those things are appetite. They are God-given, but they cannot be allowed to rule our lives. Yeah. They must not be allowed to... If, see, if you want to build anything that will last, you must take your life up to a new level of appetite, which is appetite for the things that are coming from God. Does it, does it mean that you will not enjoy anything again on this planet? No. You will enjoy many things, but there's need for control. 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 To be able to rein ourselves in and say no. Eating is different from gluttony. Drinking is different from drunkenness. And I dare to say, making love is different from promiscuity. God, and I know many people will have questions on this. God has given us the right within the ambit of our marriage to enjoy as much lovemaking, to cater to the appetite of sex. The moment that appetite goes beyond that confines, we are creating problems. Yeah. So God is not saying... Don't do this. Don't eat. He's only saying when you need to forsake food and then even when you have to eat, eat in moderation. You see, all these things I'm saying, like I said before, they may sound simple to you, but the things that make for longevity are not deep. That's the truth. They're not deep. They're not deep. They're not. They're not. Uh, foundations are usually not complicated. It's concrete and reinforcement. <laughs> it's concrete and reinforced. It's not, it's not a foundation. When you look at any building, it's about the, how, you know, where we go into the ground and how much of the strength of concrete and reinforcement. That's what holds it. And when we do it well, it just has a way of, you know, taking us to 
the, the, the height that we want to get to. Um, I have a slide that shows uh, the, like two or three characters, Abraham, Joseph, you know, and all that. Can you jump ahead? Uh, everybody look at the screen. Look at the screen. When I say spot the odd character in this, what's the odd character to my left here? What's the odd character here? The, all the other people that you, you see there, they finish well. The odd characters there, it was easy for you to spot them because of some of the things I've been talking about that they did not do well. Geazi, the discipline of appetite. Yeah. Stop thing. Esau, the same thing. The Bible says, lest any man, Hebrews 12, become a profane person or an adulterer like Esau. And you know Esau did not sleep with anybody. But, you call him <laughs> but see, they still call him adulterer. Because what he did was tantamount to lack of discipline of appetite. Yeah. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. Very important. All right. I have six more minutes. So, we've talked about discipline. Let me, I have two more things to quickly run through. The next thing I want to talk about, if I want to build to last, is prioritizing. Write it down. Prioritizing. Two things that are difficult to get people to do in life. Is to one is to think, two is to do things according to the order of importance. Anyone that wants to build to last must know the priority of each season and invest in the priority of the season if you want to build to last. The priority of the season, and how do we invest in the priority of the season? You see, in the life cycle of a ministry or any organization, there will be seasonal priorities. There's a season where the priority is training. There's a season where the, 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 the priority is expansion and even looking for properties ahead of time. There's a season where the priority for you as a man of God is to pay attention to what's happening in your family and pay real attention. Because that season will soon pass. If you want to build to last, you must invest according to the priority of the season. And the big question I want to ask somebody here today is, have you been able to identify the priority of this season? Because for, for us ministers, we like looking at Facebook to determine our own priority. We like looking at Instagram, looking at what's happening somewhere else. What is the priority of the season for you? What's the priority of the season for our ministry? It's very important. Leaders do first things first. And know that activity is, activity is not accomplishment. First things first. And that activity is not accomplishment. Let me jump on my slide to Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle works on this basis that what matters most must not be left at the mercy of the things that matter least. The things that matter most must not be left at the priority of the things that matter least. Can I say that one more time? The things that matter most must not be left at the priority, I mean, <laughs> must not be left at the mercy of the things that matter the least. Many years ago, I learned about Pareto Principle from my pastor, it's a very simple principle. You see it all over the Bible. And like I said, it's just about priority. From Pareto principle, we see that... <laughs> uh, can you put the next slide on? The one that has examples. Quickly. Yes. Look at that. So we learned that uh, when it comes to time, 20% of our time produces 80% of our result. If we want to build to last, please take a picture of this. I'm going to think about it very well. If you want to build to last, you must know what should take, you know, 80% of your time. See, as a leader, especially according to Acts chapter 6, the apostle said, 
we will pay attention to the ministry of the word and prayer. We'll put 80% of our time there. Put 20% of our time in other things. Are you still with me today? Because that will bring us 80% of our results. Many people run after the things that will only bring 20% of the result and spend 80% of their time on it. And you want to build something that will be strong, it will be difficult. So, like we say, in counseling, 20% of the people take 80% of your time. In, uh, in your job, 20% of work gives 80% of your satisfaction. So, it takes discipline to stay with that 20%. And then in donation, for instance, in church, 20% of people give 80% of the money. <laughs> in, in leadership, 20% of the people make 80% of the decisions. And even in things like picnic, only 20% of people eat 80% of the food. <laughs> so it is for all of us to recognize what 20% of our work we must be spending 80% of our time on so that I can deliver 80% of the result rather than the other way around. That's how, you know, you manage yourself as a pastor to be able to prioritize. And even as a ministry, because in the season of your priority, it means that to build well in that season, you may have to direct a bit of budget into certain area, which is the 20% that will bring 80% of the result for that season. So we don't look at what other people are doing and just say, yeah. So smart work is working with priority. And lastly, the last thing, taking calculated risk. You know I said I'm using contemporary language. Taking calculated risk. Taking calculated risk. In Matthew 14, you read the story about how, from verse 25, how Peter walked on water. It's very instructive. It's very instructive. Peter saw Jesus walking on water and said, Master, if it is you, tell me to come. Matthew 14, 25 to 29. Time will not permit me to read it. Peter discerned between faith and foolishness. Because the difference between an absolute risk and a faith-inspired action is a word from God. A word from God. A word from God. One of the greatest things I've learned from my patriarch of faith, Dr. David Oedepo, is the, that all of us must de develop the capacity to hear God perceiving. If we move to our next level. Now, when God has spoken, the indices, the optics may not look like it. He that look at the cloud will not. <laughs> so, you understand what I'm saying? It may not look like it, but we need to move. We need to move. Somebody tap your neighbor for me say, there's a need to move. To move per season. Peter got out of the boat. There's one universal truth and supernatural principle, <laughs> which is very simple. You know, I said, this, this, is, this, is, this is very simple. If you want to walk on water, you must get out of the boat. Yeah, it's not deep at all, but it's a universal principle. <laughs> it works all the time. You cannot walk on water remaining in your boat. If you want to build something that will last, you must learn to know when to come out of the boat and put your feet on water. It is called calculated risk based on an instruction from God. And as simple as this is sounding, this as made someone like myself to stay afloat the last 30 years. This year makes it 30 years that I've been officially recognized and ordained as a minister. <laughs> because it was at the inauguration of that fellowship that I was first ordained. And knowing when to put your first leg forward and come out of your comfort zone. Let me just show you this one lastly. Lastly, uh, in case somebody 
is asking, what is my boat? Yeah, put it on the screen. Yes. What's my boat? Put that last slide on the screen. Yes, yes. No. Put, yes. Your boat. Please also take a picture of that. Put it on the big screen. This, what you have on this or here. Whatever represents security to you, apart from God himself, has become a boat. Whatever you are tempted to put your trust in, it can be a human being, it can be a location. I mean, how do you describe it for someone like Bishop Wendepo to leave 5,000, 6,000 congregation in Kaduna and come to Lagos? Have you seen the picture of the first place they used in Rajoba? Pastor Amy? No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry, my time is done, but I need to say this. When you see that picture, you have to ask yourself, can I do this? Because you can be looking at what is happening there today, but if you don't go to where they are coming from, when you see the picture of somebody that left a cathedral and came to one floor of a building or something like that, where, have you seen, you have seen the picture before? You, you have to ask yourself, can I do that? Before you envy, when you go to Canada and ask see what, what, what is there today, ask yourself, can I do that? Because that's the question I ask myself. Can I do that? Can I do that? I mean, I'm coming from a tour of Europe where I was looking at our new church plants in some of those places. And one of the questions on my mind that God was also asking me, and I, I, I believe that it's not going to follow through with the question, is if I say you should leave Lekki, where you gather thousands of people every Sunday, to come and sit with this church of 150 people, can you do it? I mean, if he's telling me to do it based on the ascent of our fathers, I will do it. He's not talking to me now, so please, everyone online, there's nothing like that. I'm just giving as an example. Because you sit there to encourage the pastor there, and you're telling yourself, this thing is not really that easy. <laughs> Especially if you have been in a big place before. But to walk on water, you have to come out of your boat. Whatever keeps you so comfortable that you don't want to give it up, even at the risk of disobeying God. Whatever pulls you away from the great adventure of extreme discipleship has become a boat. Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to challenge us today that the things that make for longevity are not essentially deep. To, I mean, seriously deep things. There are some of the things that we need to pay attention to consistently, like what we have shared today. Discipline, prioritizing, and taking, working by faith, which I choose to call taking calculated risk on the word of God. On the word of God. Because somebody's listening to me today, the only proof that you have to show that you came for MLF this year is that you, there's one word that you need to obey. <laughs> that you are struggling with that as you are leaving this place now, you have received grace. With all the examples I've given, please don't leave this place and still be second guessing that maybe God is not speaking to you when you are sure that God is speaking to you. Come out of your boat because it's time for you to walk on water and our world will celebrate you. Glory be to Jesus.